Welcome everyone to InventionCon 2023. And this part of the panel discussion is gonna deal with knowing your value, equity, and ownership. We have a dynamic panel for you today, folks. First of all, we have Delany West. She's the founder and director of Creative Fixer. Uh, be super creative. Our next panelist is Sean Mastrion. He's founder and CEO of Luminor. I know I mispronounced that, Sean, forgive me. Next, we have Amber Lamke. She's the founder and CEO of Maine Grains and Company, Incorporation. My name is Al Ford Kindred. I'm a supervisor and patent examiner, but I'm also the president of USPTO Military Association, and thank you all. Uh, first of all, Delaney, introduce yourself. Uh, tell us about your company, tell us your company, your invention, and share what type of introduction intellectual property that you have. Delaney, you're up. Alfred, so my name's Delaney West. I'm founder of uh, Be Super Creative, a product um, marketing business and brand development firm. I have about 30 years in product and brand development, helping firms uh, cultivate intellectual property for their businesses. Um, I've established both design uh, and utility patents and a ton of trademarks uh, for myself and for firms. Um, the uh, most recent uh, patent award it was for a container, uh, a container design that improved manufacturing lead times. Um, and we avoided uh, filing for patent on the formula for the product to go into the, to the container because we didn't want to reveal that to everybody, right? So um, <laughs> that was one of the, the most recent um, patents awarded. Thank you, Delany. Uh, next up, we have Sean. It's your turn. Uh, introduce yourself, your company, your invention, and share what type of intellectual property you have. Absolutely. So I'm Sean Mastrian, founder of Darkside Scientific, the parent company of Lumilor, the world's only electroluminescent coding system. Um, about 15 years ago, a friend of mine, Andy, came to me and said he's got an idea to make paint light up. And I said, of course, yeah, sure, you're going to make that happen. Um, and lo and behold, he gave me a prototype and showed me that it could work. And so he was always kind of the mad scientist. I was the business guy and we formed together to try and see if we can create a marketable product out of it. Lo and behold, one day we get a secret ingredient from, uh, from overseas somewhere, he gives me a call, says we got it. And we have now a paint product. This is just a thin strip of paint that when you put electricity to it, it produces light. And so... Um, after we got it, we needed to do something to protect the, uh, the intellectual property. Uh, first and foremost, we, we knew we needed a patent on it. So we actually formed the company specifically so that we could form the patent, uh, file for the patent and have it protected because we know that that's, that's important to us to have a foundation for the, for the company. Um, since that first patent, we've realize what more of our value is as a company so that we can mass customize the coding system for various different markets. And now we have uh, two different patents that are protected worldwide, uh, over 40 countries each that have the ability to, um, to really not only protect the method of application, which is where our initial one was, uh, but also the, the mass customization and the materials. So it allows us a pretty broad space for delivering electroluminescent coding systems. Thanks, Sean. All right, Amber, you're up. Hello, everyone. My name is Amber Lamke, and 10 years ago, I launched a grain mill out of a former county jail building in my downtown, repurposing the building to take advantage of a four-story building to restore regional grain milling. And the problem we were trying to solve was that as we were all turning our attention here in rural Maine to local food and helping farmers find markets for local food, we realized that grains were missing from those conversations, largely because in the last 50 to 100 years, we have sent grain production westward from Maine to where the plains are wide open and more expansive. Um, and that has come at a cost to losing grains in our ecosystem here and all the things and benefits that come from growing grains, everything from food and animal feed, but also to straw and natural ways to uh, manage weed growth on your farm or hold the soil in place. 
So we have restored grain production to Maine and our region and rebuilt the infrastructure that makes it possible to clean and mill those grain, grains into delicious human grade food for bakers, brewers and chefs around the Northeast. So my story and involvement in this panel today has to do with the work that's gone into building our brand and our visual look as a product um, and how we chose to protect our mark, protect some of the design elements, um, knowing that and having seen uh, that sometimes uh, brands are vulnerable to larger companies that can use that look um, to squeeze you out of the marketplace. I, that is something I had seen in my travels and that um, kind of motivated our desire to protect our mark. So uh, I look forward to telling our story with you. Awesome, thank you. And I, I think we're very privileged too to have a, a well diverse panel. We have somebody with a registered mark. We have somebody that has a patent. And we also have somebody that has everything. She teaches it all, patents, trademarks, and all of that kind of stuff. So we're going to have an awesome panel today. So with that said, and we're going to start off with you first, uh, Delaney. When you first started out, did you have anybody, just when you, before you got into uh, intellectual property or thinking about it, did you have any naysayers when you started going in that direction of, of getting your intellectual property and trying to protect your intellectual property, or in your case, teacher? teacher? Um, you know, learning the process um, in the beginning, what I had to learn to embrace uh, was critique. Um, critique being a part of your development process actually helps you develop a stronger idea. I know people run from it. Some people can't stomach um, critical remarks, but it, it makes your product better, your idea better. I always ask someone to help them give me the critique. What do you hate about this? Tell me what you dislike. I ask that question first, because usually they're trying to be polite. They don't want to tell you what they don't like, but then you get some really honest insight about what you're working on. And then I say, well, now tell me the good stuff. So I, I invite the naysayers. It helps me sharpen my ideas. Thank you. Amber? Well, I was a first-time entrepreneur and business owner when I started Main Grain. So we have had a lot of pushback on a lot of fronts. Um, I would say, um, you know, the largest kind of um, um, shift we were asking people to consider is, is it appropriate to, appropriate to grow grains on a small scale when it might not be the most economical way to grow grains? What if those grains aren't cheap? Maine is a terrain and a geography with lots of rocks, a coast, rivers, mountains. We are not a plains state. And yet we have a long history of growing grains here um, that benefit the ecosystem, as I described before. So, you know, that was a, a challenge to overcome, uh, getting folks on board to the idea that even though our grains might cost a bit more, there's tremendous benefit to supporting a product that is grown and produced in your region. Um, you know, other pushback, you know, has come from just, you know, we converted a jail building into our mill and uh, was that the best use for the for the property? Um, it, you know, was I to be trusted to do a development project like that? And, um, you know, how do you be a pioneer and take a product to market that is that is new and innovative. So we've uh, overcome a lot of challenges in the last 10 years. And I would agree, agree with Delany that really some of those challenges are where some of your best solutions come from. And also um, uh, persisting through solving your challenges is how you build respect and brand and you show people that you can be trusted to do what you say you are going to do. So some of that challenge and pushback over the years has garnered some of the greatest support that we have now. So thank you. All right. All right, Sean, you up? So I think from the, the get go, we wanted to create something that was of value because we had a, a, a unique product offering in the, in the market space. We had paint that was light. And it's been for the past 12 years, we've been trying to figure out what exactly are we as a company? Are we a paint company? Uh, are we a lighting company? Are we a services company where we provide those services to, to people? And really uh, modern companies need to kind of be all those, those things if that's what we need to be. But at the end of the day, 
it was always clear that we are really an intellectual property company. We had cracked the egg. We cracked a secret formula to make paint light up. And now when the, through the evolutions and understanding our customer base a little better and understanding how to go after different markets, our intellectual property has evolved to a way to match really how we're going to market. And that's been a, a critical evolution. I mean, certainly there's been a lot of challenges and a lot of questioning about go to market strategy and markets to address and how to do it in paint versus light or whatever. Um, but at the end of the day, keeping our intellectual property solid uh, allows us to have value as a company, something for our shareholders that continues to, to drive and maintain value and also allows large corporations the comfort of working with us, knowing that there's something proprietary to the relationship and some value that we're providing to them because we have that, that solid IP background. What, now just to, to, to follow up on that, what do you mean by that you have an intellectual property company? What do you mean by that? Yeah, absolutely. So intellectual property company is, we have a set of tools that we know how to make paint light up, um, but it doesn't have to be paint. It can be inks. It can be, uh, there's different coatings that we we're allowed to do and different methods of application. What we've protected is the ability not only to apply those in, in various areas, but to, to customize those formulations. That allows us to do two things that are very important. Number one is licensing. In today's world, and that's one of the things that we realized when we first came out, you're global instantaneously, whether you like it or not. And so we had global challenges, people you know, coming at us from all across the planet, asking us to be able to serve them. We simply can't do that with a, with a startup infrastructure. So having an intellectual property foundation allows us the ability to license the product and reach other markets that we weren't able to do. And also from a distribu distribution standpoint as well, when we put products into markets, our customers need to know that those products are, are, are protected and their investment in us is protected in the marketplace as well. And they have the confidence then to represent us in the marketplace. Awesome. That leads into the question that I have now. Um, we we all know that the importance of intellectual property. First of all, it, it's a large portion of our gross domestic product, and we know that that helps our country stay ahead of the technological curve. And we also know it's, it's written in the Constitution, so we know how important intellectual property is to the world and to the United States. So, to you all individually, we're going to start off with you first, um, Sean. What does your intellectual property mean to you? Yeah, so from, from my perspective, my intellectual property is uh, the foundation. It's the soul of our company, um, the ability, and, and we continue to, to drive and, and, and deliver intellectual property because without that, we don't have a soul as a company. Uh, we have to have something, a foundation to build on, and we find new ways of, of doing what we do but at the end of the day, it's the, the knowledge in, in our people that develops into physical manifestations of that, that is rooted into something that's, that's fundamentally protected. Uh, that's, that's really what our company's all about. Okay. Awesome, thank you. All right, uh, Delaney? Yeah, wow, it's, um, it's, um, it, 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 it's so valuable. It's what pushed me into entrepreneurship um, the value of my ideas were, were greater than the value as, of Delany as a headcount in a firm. Um, you know, IP is everything, you know, in the process, going through the process of, uh, uh, you know, gaining your intellectual property, it means that you have a strong idea because you've done the work, um, it, you've created something that, that you can defend, um, you, you created something that uh, doesn't infringe on an existing uh, intellectual property. Um, and also, you know, you're generating value, whether you're marketing it, selling it yourself or licensing it, um, you are mitigating uh, threats to protect your concept and you're creating a barrier to entry for your competitors. So learning that early on in my career um, was a light bulb moment for me. Thank you. Um, Amber, I want you to answer the same question, but also I want you, you may have some, 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 uh, some visuals that you may want to show us to, to answer that question on what does your intellectual property mean to you? 
Sure, sure. I will show you a couple of visuals and I'll, and I'll start with the story here as I queue up the slide. Um, but when we started Maine Grains 10 years ago, uh, really stone milling flour had disappeared in this country. Uh, there is no place to formally learn how to mill flour. The majority of the flour in our country is white flour now. So um, I was part of a grassroots effort to start this event called the Kneading Conference, which brought together bakers and brewers and chefs to talk about the revival of regional grain economies. And as I mentioned, um, I bought this old jail building in the center of my downtown because it had a four-story section that we could take advantage of vertical height for milling to restore a stone mill infrastructure. So here's the picture of our facility um, today. And, and what I wanted to share is that in the process to learn stone milling, I had traveled to Europe, um, specifically to Denmark. Um, and this package right here is an example of a company that uh, I met with over in Denmark. And when I took this picture, they were in the midst of a legal dispute, having won awards for this beautifully designed flower package um, and having had a grocery store chain copy the package and undercut them on price side by side on the shelf. And so I knew as we got ready to um, build our own package design and brand look that I needed to be careful about the marks and protect them as we went along the way. So I'll show you just a couple more slides of where we ended up, but we, we ended up taking inspiration from some of the history in flower bags and the beautiful design that went into both cloth and paper flower bags of a previous era. We took the beautiful um, design of the actual millstones that we're using to make flour, and we built a package design that reflected that we are millers, we are organic, we are local, uh, we have an agro-Victorian feel, if you will, to our building. Uh, there's kind of a heaviness to our building, and there's a tough resilience in the farmers of Maine, juxtaposed with some of the beautiful features of this Victorian mill and being a woman-owned company. So um, in any event, we now have a family of uh, products that we produce here at the mill, and our brand look is very important to us because it helps us to define who we are and um, communicate the personality of our business. Thank you for sharing that, Amber. That, that was really interesting. And uh, with that said, uh, Sean, we, we would like you to do the same thing. You can bring that strip of light that you have and, and bring back. And just tell us how you came about. <laughs> with that, how did it come up? Were you riding your bike or what, what happened? How, how did you even think about that? Go ahead. So again, this is just to, to be clear what this is. This is a thin piece of vinyl that is coated with our paint, essentially. Um, and what it allows us to do is have the world's thinnest light. So this is 100 microns thick versus the, the lighting, and we're able to coat any surface. This just happens to be a piece of vinyl that's flexible, but we can coat any three-dimensional object with uh, a coating of light in it. And you can see it's it's even and consistent. You can do branding elements. You can see that's our Lumilor brand that we've represented in this uh, test strip that's there, uh, design elements, safety, et cetera. Uh, really, the inspiration was from my uh, my partner. He was... He was a painter by trade. Uh, he had developed a, a glow-in-the-dark bicycle, but he wasn't able to control the light. And so the idea of controlling light as paint came in his head. He was a brilliant gentleman. And so unfortunately, we lost him uh, about a few years ago, but uh, it was just a, a, a brilliant man and, and just a great person to have a, have a conversation with and just, you know, with ideas. Had these had these great ideas, and then the two of us worked together to take those ideas and turn it into a reality, to a marketable product. And we didn't even know what we developed. Then we just developed something cool for for motorcycles and cars. Um, I got a '69 Lincoln Continental that I'm painting with my uh, with my paint as well, which is uh, which is pretty cool. But it's gone further than that. We've been on the side of an Airbus. Uh, we have major automotive manufacturers that are working with us as well. And again, because we had that foundation in intellectual property and we have that patent protection, we're able to go into these larger fields and these larger opportunities and people give us the uh, the, the credibility to, to be able to work with the major partners. 
That's awesome. Awesome story. Um, Delaney? Uh, Delaney? So, <laughs> the, one that I'll, the one that I'll talk about um, um, relates to also um, what um, Amber, Amber uh, referred to in terms of uh, the importance of packaging and branding, but this solution uh, also solved manufacturing lead times. And so the challenge was a uh, how to reduce manufacturing lead times. How could we uh, expand the product category quickly and, and, and speak to consumer needs? And so the patent was on a container um, and it utilized a design patent to um, remove the need to source um, multiple colors of, of plastic so that you could have a customized container. So we took that process, uh, simplified it to a clear barrel and some other manufacturing techniques. And so we could deliver what the customer wanted in terms of new options quickly. And so we reduced cost um, about 14% on materials and we were able to increase production lead times by 40% by doing so. And so this is a case where you've you've taken a design patent and you've used that um, to increase some of your production processes. The only way that I could do that, you know, to Amber's point, was going to the factory, talking to the, the lines that are working the, the production lines, watching the fact, watching how they manufacture product, and then with the design brain saying, wow, we could re-engineer this if we just did these few things. No one else would have thought about that unless, you know, you had that connection. And so it's important to do the research to Amber's point. And that was um, something that gave me insight to make that change. And of course, people thought it was, you know, maybe not a good idea in the beginning. But once they understood the outcome, it was a win to, to, to invest in, 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 you know, getting that protected. Okay. Um, just, I'm, I'm going to stick with you, um, Delaney. Um, how did you get started? I mean, you know, we, you and I had a conversation about school and college and stuff like that. It, 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 retell that story, please. <laughs> well, I think, I think I, you know, I wanted to be an architect, right? And, you know, the math, it, math side of my brain said, no, this is not for you. So I will say, you know, graphic design program at Hampton University and HBCU saved me um, they had a fantastic graphic design program, uh, and that's what I was first introduced to the Macintosh. Thank you, Steve Jobs, because it allowed me to articulate what was in my mind. I could create that with my hands. You know, the, ol the only other time I have ever experienced that in life was playing an instrument, playing the piano, playing the violin. But now I could, it, you know, articulate these thoughts of creation using the Macintosh. That changed everything for me, which led to a career and graphic design um, at a small firm whose owners let me grow and learn. Uh, I think six months after I had my first job out of college, they put me on a plane and shipped me off to Taiwan where I was sitting on a production line uh, with the translator learning about manufacturing. You know, that changed everything for me and the way I work today. Awesome. Just one more question for you. Now, did, yeah. you, did, did, you, honest, did you know about intellectual property before you had the idea? or after you started the idea? I, you know, I didn't know. You know, you know, you the light bulb moment for me um, was early in my career when I when I understood that my ideas is what was, was valuable to the company. Like me coming in every day and working and doing these things. Yeah, they needed that. But what they needed were these ideas that they could sell, you know, the ability to come up with naming convention. Not everybody can do that. Like, I had to do that, I had to do that like breathing, right? When you come up with a, a clever name for something that you could defend, come up with the next idea that we could pitch to this retailer. So understanding that that was the secret sauce for me, then I understood it became important to protect uh, the, the value that I was able to generate, not only for firms, but the things that I was able to, to um, uh, generate and protect those ideas for myself. Thank you. Very interesting. What about you, Amber? Yeah, I think there's a common thread here that we're all problem solvers, right? So <laughs> my uh, background is not in grains or farming or milling. I have a master's in communication disorders and was practicing as a speech language pathologist when my small town of Skowhegan, about 8,000 people, was designated as a Main Street community, 
which basically means that we agreed that we would work together on downtown revitalization. And I plugged in as a volunteer to help grow our farmer's market and grow the audience for local food. In Maine, many of the farmer's markets have rules that you need to grow or produce everything that you bring to a market. And yet bakers somehow were getting a wild card because we can't grow grains here, or they could bring banana bread, but because they made it, but it had nothing to do with wheat and bananas and sugar, which don't come from here. So it really stimulated a new way of thinking at the regional level about grain production. We know that we've been growing grains in these regions for a long time as cover crops and for animals. Um, I was describing earlier in the green room how we grow buckwheat here, uh, which is a French Canadian tradition for making the traditional foods like crepes and ploys and things like that. So we knew that our stories and our cultural foods come from having grains in the ecosystem. And um, we realized that the obstacle to reviving a regional grain economy was the lack of machines and infrastructure to clean out things like weed seeds and chaff and Oats, which grow really well in a cool, wet climate like Maine, need machinery to crack off a husky coating so you can get to the edible part on the inside. So uh, that infrastructure needed to be restored in order to revive this cluster of goods and services and uh, benefits that come from a grain economy. And I would just close by saying that uh, in, in my wildest dreams, I really didn't realize what the restoration of infrastructure would do for an ecosystem around our entrepreneurial project. So not only do we have flour and grains produced right here, uh, but there are lots of entrepreneurial spin-offs, new businesses forming to make pasta, crackers, ice cream sandwiches with a cookie that has our grains in it, pizza dough. Um, new entre the newest entrepreneurs of this year are people cultivating insects to feed birds and backyard chickens and mushrooms in our byproducts. And so, you know, there is really ecosystem development around entrepreneurship and problem solving that has benefits for uh, communities and the economy in general. Thank you. And uh, were, you, were you going to say something, Sean? Um, no, I was, uh, you know, if you, if you want to go through my story, we can, but I think we've, we've, we've got that a few times. It's okay. just always, it's always fun though, listening to, to, to Amber and uh, Delany, just like the, the journey through there is a lot of, there's a lot of accidental discoveries that you get throughout your life. You know, you graduate from college and you think you've got the whole world figured out and you have absolutely nothing and you have to just be able to, to react and respond. I, I graduate, the joke I always make is. I graduated with a chemical engineering degree from MIT. Um, my first job was for an electrical wiring device company. And then 20 years later, I found out how to combine the two. So. <laughs> and then, and then could you just go into the part about uh, the mad scientist and the business person? Yeah. So it was, uh, and we've always had this, this amalgamation. I obviously have a technical background that I, that I could bring to the table and understand exactly what was going on. And that's, you know, kind of touch on that later. It's very important when we're going through the patent process as well, is that the, the people that we're working with from, from that side have that, have that background too. But when we, when we first got into this, we're really just experimenting, right? And just good old garage innovation, right? He had, uh, he had ideas, he had ideas of, of things that might work. And it's interesting because he would talk to me and then I would kind of, you know, do the, the bartering. It's like, well, we're going to be huge. So I'll gladly pay you Tuesday for a hamburger today. Right. And, uh, you know, kind of going through that, that entire process, beg, borrow and steal. I mean, we were literally a garage shop. It, it wasn't even that fancy. It was a storage unit. It was our, our first, um, office per se. And it was just a matter of, you know, I was doing my job. I was a CEO of a cybersecurity company at the time, oddly enough. And just taking the time to learn and research and understand, okay, wow, there's a, there's, a, there's a lot of information out here and a lot of science. And you started applying that and then the applied science as well. And that, that was kind of the, the marriage of our, the meshing of the gears as well. And at some point we, uh, we got the secret sauce and it, uh, it came out, so. Good deal. Now, this, this question is gonna be for you, for, for the whole panel. 
is for you to, to tell the audience, you know, um, if they're thinking about going in the direction that you've already went down or a path that you've already gone down, what advice would you give them um, uh, to, to help them succeed um, to, to avoid some of the roadblocks and stumbles that you had? And we're going to start off with um, Delamy. Oh, that's a great question. Um, so I would say, and and we you know, we didn't talk about this really in the green in the green room, but you've got to um, get feedback, right? But you also have to know who to invite into the process. It's got to be somebody that you trust. You might want to get some NDA uh, language, you know, constructed around you know, before you share. And even still, you have to be careful. Um, but I think the, the most important thing to even get to that point is being able to uh, articulate your concept in a way that you can get the feedback. You know, is that a sketch? Is that a prototype? You know, a handmade prototype? You've got to, you know, you know, sketch of the logo. You've got to get that concept to a point where you can get feedback, right? And so that's really important. But the other thing is I live on the search engine, so Tess. Um, I learned, you know, as a part of, you know, um, managing budget that do as much of this work as you can before you work with, you know, the intellectual, intellectual property attorney. Right. Um, so do as much of the research as you can. I got really good at using tests to kind of understand the categories that were available or, and you find out surprises that, you know, your competitors had registered something in this category and you knew a new product was coming. So I would say, you know, there's a lot of research tools that are available, but Use uh, the electronic search system. Do as much of that research as you can. Use the internet to do do as much research as you can, and just be very careful in who you um, invite to your process to to review your initial idea. Awesome, and then just to piggyback on that, um, the test system is a, is a part of the USPTO system. So if you go to the main website, you can type in test. You can get to that system that she's talking about, and it's awesome. All right, Amber. Oh, similarly, I would say that I surrounded myself in mentors and was aware that I was embarking on a process that was new to me, uh, but that I but that I knew in my heart of hearts I had a solution uh, for my community. And so, you know, you want to find people that have been down this path before, maybe in other industries, some that have succeeded, some that have failed and are willing to share their stories with you. Um, I got you know key nuggets of advice along the way, raised twice as much money as you think you're going to need because uh, uh, you will need it. Um, <laughs> you know, how do you prioritize when the task list starts to mushroom and grow and grow and grow, staying super focused on um, what the solving the challenge of the day is going to be? Um, build your network. Uh, financing a new business is not easy. And so for us, we were very... Um, grassroots and uh, not expected to be a fast growth company. In milling, you have slim margins and expensive equipment and upstart costs. So we really benefited from uh, connecting with a network of social investors who had social goals in addition to uh, financial goals. Uh, we recognized that you know, we were raising money in 2008 <laughs> when, when, when finances were a challenge, and yet we uh, we presented an alternative to the stock market. We are a, a we are a local investment that you can make, and we were able to define our ROI beyond financial. So uh, invest in us, and you are preserving the farm next door to you. You are making delicious food resources in your own community that you can enjoy. Uh, you might earn better interest than you would in the stock market. Uh, we figured out how to build peer-to-peer -peer loan agreements so that we could execute as much of the loan agreements ourselves without the help of banks and lawyers. Um, so, so we built a an, kind of a battery of tools to be able to use to bring people on board who wanted to join the team and help us uh, get started. So build your network, um, get good at your storytelling, uh, I love dissecting messages and understanding how to lead with why, why are you doing what you're doing, you know, then tell people how, then tell them what you're doing. Um, 
Uh, I love figuring out how your weaknesses can actually be your strengths. So, you know, really diving into uh, your storytelling and, and, and how to tell your compelling uh, message is really important. Awesome. Thanks, Amber. All right, Sean. What would you tell the audience on, you know, some of the things that you've done? and, and what Yeah, so I think that there's, uh, I'll speak a little bit from the perspective of intellectual property in terms of some of the key lessons that we have learned from this. Uh, when we first, our first patent, we figured out what worked, and then we articulated that very cleanly. Uh, that allowed us to go through the examination process absolutely clean. We didn't have any marks on it. We had completely new and innovative intellectual property, which was great. The challenge was is that we taught people how to do what we do. So lesson number one is that if you have something valuable, somebody's going to steal it from you. And that's, that's the reality of life. And I'm not going to say that that's okay, but you've got to be okay with that. You've got to let them take the jar of pennies off the counter and keep the gold locked up in the safe under the counter, right? So and we got we got a little spun up about that, and we might have been a little too prescriptive in the first one. Now, granted, our first patent protects uh, very cleanly the method of application, which is which is an incredibly valuable part of our of our portfolio. But we have somebody that literally hung up a shingle, created a new company, and sold people the recipe for electrical luminous and paint, which was a copy of our patent. They were literally selling our patent to people that wanted to steal from us. And so the second time around, we, we got a little more creative. We had to realize, going back to what sort of company we are, the ability to customize the coding. We started learning what actually makes the coding work. And that's still the value, the most valuable thing that we provide to the market today. And so the ability to, to customize that, what we created was instead of a, a specific recipe, we created parameters around ourselves. It's like this could work with this, 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 and this. Now, granted, this might be the sweet spot and this might be the sweet spot of that, but it's harder to for people to, to get to that but it also allows us to do the customization within that parameter in any way, because we know that this is a field that could emit light with paint. So these binders, these pigments, et cetera, mixing all that up. So long story short, creating a wider space for ourselves, parameters, you know, 15 to 87%, something along those lines. Obviously that's maybe a little too wide, but understanding that, you know, within this sort of a parameter, we can have then the ability to do that, and and that that second patent became a lot more rich in terms of uh, in terms of formulation, and our intellectual property strategy necessarily aligns with how we do business as a company, because again, a lot of our business is working with large manufacturers. Like we flew on the outside of an Airbus, uh, over three hundred takeoffs and landings successfully on that. We couldn't use the same paint that we did in the in the garage. So we had to be able to customize that. And we were actually the only product ever to go from concept to flying in under a year in the history of Airbus, just because our IP strategy was aligned with how we do business. And then that was all protected all the way through. And that's awesome. That's awesome. Um, I, mean, I want to do something a little bit different here. Each of you have something that's unique about you. So I wanted to know if you can connect the audience <laughs> with that something that's unique about you and intellectual property or your journey getting your intellectual property. If there's some type of correlation, some type of connection. All right. So uh, who want to start off first? I'm not going to pick anybody. If somebody want to start off first, if not, I'll pick somebody. I'll start. Okay. So I'll say my excessive approach to to um, being a triathlete and 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 um, loving biking, having four different types of bike, right? Bikes, right? That is a form of research. That is really a form of that's a way that I approach projects, right? I want to understand how to maximize my performance by by having four different bikes, right? And um, training on four different bikes. So. I guess that's a connection to my research process. I'm, I think it is. I think that's that's the explanation for the excessive behavior. Okay, and and, and I wish you guys could have seen us in the green room when they were talking when they were talking about bikes. And Sean's face lit up. You know, oh, I have a certain, certain amount of bikes too. So uh, that was I thought that was interesting. There's always some type of relationship between the two. Something that's unique about you and something that uh, deal with intellectual property. Well, I'm gonna. Go ahead, okay. Sean back on you know what 
the the design and the thoughtfulness of the designs that Amber has put into her um, into her portfolio. It's it's really fundamental to a lot of stuff that we do as well. Everything starts at the design. And everything starts with the consumer experience, right? You have to understand what the consumer wants, what your what's out there, what their interests are, et cetera. And that's what and that's really what Delany does for a living as well. Is that you know she helps to map that in and to take people along that that journey as well. I'm just like a, a particular use case of it, but really understanding you know, how you're, you're designing things for the consumer and what your, your real value is and what, what you're doing. And I, and Amber, I love the fact that you, you're not, your value isn't just in what you do. It's your value is in what you're building for the community. And that's the thing is that you need to understand that you're, you're a global citizen in this, in this whole adventure. And, and I love that you get that. And I think that, you know, I think that all three of us you know, think and operate that way. And, and, and if you have that, that global mindset and that and the community first and understand that you have a bigger impact than just a thing that you have, you're impacting lives with everything you do. And I think that that's it. That's important. I agree wholeheartedly. All right, Amber, is Nick, what makes you well, something unique about you and how is that connected to intellectual property? Oh, thanks. Um, well, thanks for those comments, Sean. I would say, um, you know, we are this uh, melding of our past experiences. So I think it's no mistake that my past experience as a, a speech pathologist and in communications where I, I studied but, uh, communication so intensively and a side love of art uh, have sort of combined into a business like this where I get to exercise both of those talents. Um, um, I am an identical twin, and I am very much enjoying sharing my lessons learned in this business with my sister, who is transforming her professional life right now, having started a business that uses our flour in pizza dough that she has taken to market. She is blending her unique talents in oc occupational therapy and understanding um, the needs of individuals with unique needs and employing them in her business to um, provide a structured workplace post high school uh, that can put their talents to work, even though they may have challenges in their lives to make this really wonderful pizza dough product. So um, fun now to be a mentor in this stage of my life uh, uh, to a twin and to others in the community that are using our grains. Oh, wow, thank you. Uh, we got a triathlete and we got a twin. And we also have somebody that's been on the national stage, national television, since he was 12 years old. So that's why he's so smooth here today, folks. See, he's he, he's been here before. 12 years old, he was on the national stage, on national television. So how does that, Sean, could you connect that with uh, intellectual property and where you are now? Yeah, so the the first the first time we were we were on the national stage was a show called Three Two One Contact, which you need to have a little gray hair or absence of hair, as the case may be, uh, in order to understand what that was. Uh, my team in uh, in Southern Virginia, we uh, Tab Intermediate School down there in, uh, in the Hampton Roads area. We developed a car based off of a Leonardo da Vinci concept that was powered on springs. And so it was, it was fun. We, we did have the advantage, a little bit of an advantage that one of the guy's dads owned a body shop. And so we were able to do things like welding that, uh, that gave us a slight advantage in, in doing this, but it, we, had, we created a, a fun concept and it's just that the, there was a teacher there, uh, Mrs. Bailey, that really spurred creativity in us. She took us a group of us as kids and she she poured into us. She poured in the ability to. We always had creative problem solving, and, and that's what we. And that's why we got into this competition in the first place. And, and I think that just because somebody cared enough about me at that age to to teach me and to educate me and to and to encourage and foster that spirit of entrepreneurship. Um, that's just that's in my brain, and that's the way I, I think and operate these days. So. Uh, to pick it back off of that, I think that's a good question. This is to everybody, you know, uh, how how important is your support system uh, when thinking about protecting your intellectual property or you in your your, your career uh, as a whole? You know, how important is your your support system? Um, you, uh, Amber, you can start off and then. Um, sure. 
Sure, thank you. And that I did have a note that I wanted to share that I got my start and built confidence with the small business development centers. Um, we all have them at our state level. Um, the services were free here to me and um, I was able to build a business plan and test out ideas and and have holes picked in my arguments uh, early on through um, a counselor made available through the SBA. So I encourage you to find that local office, um, those of you on the call who are in the early stages, because that's incredibly helpful and they can help you build that early network of mentors once you grow beyond the initial SBA services. Awesome. Thank you. Delaney? Um, I agree with that, uh, Amber. I've actually, you know, uh, supported entrepreneurs um, at SBA and doing that work. You know, sharing knowledge from my experience has been helpful. And for me, it's um, being connected to a really diverse ecosystem of people in a lot of different industries. And so I'm plugged into the entrepreneurial uh, community in a couple of different categories, into the investor community in a couple of different categories. And, um, you know, being able to do things online make it a lot easier for us to connect with someone who might be in Silicon Valley, someone who might be in Hong Kong. And so I work really hard to develop diverse networks so that I can have access to thought leaders. You know, I've been known to jump in my car and drive six hours to be in a room of experts just so I can make those connections and get that knowledge. And so for me, it's diverse ecosystem building that gets you close, closer to um, uh, expert knowledge. Thank you. All right. Sean, take us home. Yeah. So I think just to, to piggyback on that, there's entrepreneurial support organizations in every city. Um, Jumpstart in Cleveland helped us out tremendously. Great group of people there. In fact, that's how we got connected with the uh, USPTO. Um, Capital Factory down here in Austin. Uh, again, there's this is a if you're going into this, there's a journey here and it's very complicated. And there are people that have done it before. So the, the ability to have mentors is is absolutely valuable. Um, and you know, Delany hit on this in the in the early phases, and I just want to reinforce that is that you don't need anyone telling you how good you are, right? Those those people aren't useful to you. If you have a bunch of yes people around you, then that's that that doesn't make you better. You need to grow for adversity, you know. You need to you need to understand, you need to be challenged. If you have a stupid idea, you need somebody to tell you that's a stupid idea, right? <laughs> and and I and that's that's how you grow, that's how you get better. So just it, the advice part of it, it, it people really underestimate how important it is to have the right mentorship and relationships and leadership. That's 90% of your success. You know, your product and your intellectual property, if you have a, there's a lot of good ideas out there. I go in Capital Factory, I see pitches, and I see great ideas all the time. Um, but when you see there's a, the execution side of it, and a lot of that is it's leadership, it's getting the right advice, it's attacking the right markets. So surround yourself with good people, uh, and then the rest will follow. Thank you. I think we're right up against the hour. Um, I think we're going a little bit over time, but uh, thank you guys for a lively conversation. Very informative. I really appreciate it. Um, Yes, we had a couple of visitors. On behalf of USPTO, um, we want to thank Del Delany West. I got it, Delany. <laughs> Amber Lamke, Sean Mestrian. Thank you guys for a lively conversation. I appreciate it. 